I assume I don't have to introduce that lonely man sitting stage center. I don't have to tell you he wrote words and music to such uh, internationally acclaimed musicals as Godspell, Pippin, The Magic Show. He collaborated with Leonard Bernstein on Mass. He collaborated with the composer Charles Strauss on the musical Rags. He wrote a little musical some of you might know called Wicked, which is currently playing here in Sydney. Uh, for motion pictures, he collaborated with composer Alan Menken for scores to Pocahontas, The Hunchback of Notre Dame, and Enchanted. He wrote his own words and music to Prince of Egypt. Uh, he most recently wrote his first opera called Seance on a Wet Afternoon, which premiered in America uh, last year, and it's going to actually be performed here in Australia in 2012, as well as in New York City at the New York City Opera this coming April. Uh, please welcome, and it's my privilege to sit on the same stage with the true giant of the American musical theater, Stephen Schwartz. There's so much to talk about, and we really have a limited amount of time, so I'm going to ask a lot of questions, which I hope and assume are the kind of questions that you'd like to uh, hear Stephen uh, respond to. And the first question uh, writers often get who, are, who have become successful, how did you get started? Uh, how, did, uh, how did you find your path to success? And I know that Stephen's college days were quite important in the development of his career, and I thought I'd have you first talk a little bit about uh, your work at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, well, um, I grew up um, because my parents um, were theater goers and took me at a very early age to see musical theater. Um, I grew I, and I became immediately enamored of it and um, as a musical kid sort of put my focus in that direction and knew from a pretty early age that my goal was to write for musical theater. Um, when I was in high school, and I took classical piano, et cetera, when I was in high school, I went to the uh, Juilliard School of Music in New York City and studied uh, composition, piano, um, theory, and all that stuff there. Um, got a little bit of orchestration practice. And, but then for um, university, I went to Carnegie Mellon, and I was um, a drama major. I was actually a directing major there. Um, while I was at Carnegie Mellon, there was an organization, an extracurricular organization, that did an original musical every year, student written, student directed, student performed, et cetera. And I wound up co-writing the show um, all four years that I was there. This was enormously good experience. And did you uh, write those shows as a composer, as a lyricist, or both? Both. I, um, but I collaborated because it was, you know, a, a student organization. So the first two years, um, I co-wrote uh, with a, a woman named Iris Ben Ratner, subsequently Rainer, who be, uh, went on to become famous Beaches. as the author of Beaches, among other things. Um, and uh, my third year there, with a friend of mine named Ron Strauss, um, we collaborated on a musical which was then called Pippin. Pippin, um, somewhere along the line, one of those Pippins fell by the <laughs> wayside. Um, and then I actually did a, an extremely bad one-act opera uh, my, my senior year there. Um, but the point being that, you know, at university, under these circumstances, it was a very safe environment, um, you know, and, and so you could, obviously you were trying to do the best you could, but the shows weren't terribly good, but learning about, um, you know, what worked and what didn't work and writing a musical from scratch was enormously valuable. Um, did you record the shows? Do you have copies of some of those musicals that you wrote? Yes, but I'll never, nobody will ever <laughs> hear them. Um, but uh, uh, ultimately, through a whole series of events, which is too long to recount now and not so interesting anyway, um, when I came to New York, um, I came sort of trying to uh, push the idea of doing um, Pippin, of continuing Pippin. And um, my collaborator had uh, abandoned ship at that point. Um, and what happened was that um, at, at a certain point, an, a, a backers audition was organized so I could get some seed money to afford to work on the show. And to that backers audition, through, again, through a very random series of events, one of the singers in the back, backers audition knew someone who knew someone at an agency. Anyway, an agent came. And uh, she came up to me, a writer's agent. She came up to me after the audition, and she said, look, I don't really know about musicals. I don't like musicals very much, but I have a colleague 
at my agency named Shirley Bernstein, Mary Bernstein's sister, who does know about musicals. And from what I can tell, I think you're talented, and I'm going to tell her about you. And, um, and although I was extremely cynical, you know, by that point at, you know, age 20 and didn't believe that she would, she actually did. And, um, and Shirley called me a couple of weeks later, and I went in and played for her, and she became my agent. And she took me around to play the score for Pippin for producers and record companies. I wound up getting a job at what was then RCA Records um, and uh, publishers and all the rest of it. Um, and that was, you know, it became a calling card. The point of this long story being that it's, I think it's very helpful to have a calling card, something that you have written, and that you can then present to people if they want to hear some of your work. You know, you and I have a mutual friend, John Bacchino, who's a wonderful writer. And it used to astonish me that um, I would be out to dinner with John, and he would be dressed like this. And someone would come up to the table and they would say, oh, you know, I've heard your name. I hear you're a writer. And he'd be like, here, here's a CD. Mm -hmm. I have no idea where it came from. I, you, he may have a body <laughs> cavity that has CDs and like a, a, a marsupial pouch. But anyway, <laughs> out would come the CD. Uh, but that was enormously useful to John. The point being, you know, have something to show. And the people to whom you're showing these things may not be interested in that specific project but it can lead to them knowing about you and, and perhaps some other project coming up. Uh, a question. Uh, when, after graduating from school and having this calling card, was Broadway indeed your goal, or was it just theater in general? Musical theater. Musical theater, yeah. I mean, I, you know, I, I didn't know necessarily that I had the opportunity to work on Broadway. However, that being said, because I think this is another uh, important sort of piece of advice that I feel, New York was where musical theater was happening. It still is sort of the center of musical theater in America, but that's become more decentralized. But at that time, if you wanted to work in musical theater, particularly original musical theater, you had to be in New York. The point being that sometimes, you know, I'll get an email from someone, you know, in, in Saskatchewan, Canada, and they'll be, you know, they'll say, um, I really want to be a musical theater writer. Do you have advice for me? My first advice is, yes, get out of Saskatchewan. <laughs> you know, get somewhere where people are doing the kind of work you want to be doing so you can network and meet people. And because so much of it is about, uh, uh, is about that, I, I, I found. Progressing is about networking and somebody that you don't even know who it is hearing something that you've done and telling somebody else about you who introduces, who tells Michael Kirker and so on, you know, things like that. And just keeping uh, uh, feet planted forward, keep moving, keep opening those doors, not knowing where it might lead to. Yeah, and most doors are going to be shut to you. I mean, let's face that, you know. I mean, the thing about show business in general, whether it's the music business or theater or whatever, is that paradoxically, paradoxically and, and simultaneously, Everybody wants to be, to get on the bandwagon of the next big thing, and nobody wants to hear anything new. So somehow, you have to go from the nobody wants to hear anything new category to the, oh, this might be the next big thing category. And that's a sort of mysterious alchemy. It, it involves being around long enough to kind of begin to hit critical mass. Before we move on from this topic, one, one last question. Uh, we, we keep talking about Broadway, but would you agree that Broadway does not necessarily have to be the goal nowadays, is oh, it? Oh, completely, yeah. Uh, um, you know, these days there are, I mean, I've had that experience, and I know of, of many other examples of pieces for musical theater that for various reasons aren't really right for Broadway, and yet they become very popular and produced all over the place. Um, you know, there are, there are a long list of examples. I mean, obviously the good thing about a Broadway production is that it gives a, a, a certain notoriety, it focuses attention on the work, and it's, it's easier for people in other parts of the state, certainly, to, uh, to be able to program it. But it's not, um, it's not necessary anymore the way it used to be. And would you also say that beginning writers should possibly concentrate on writing musicals that are smaller in scale because they're easier to get on? Or do well, sure. I mean, I, I hate to say that. I mean, I feel like people should write what they want to write. 
And if, if your vision is to write something that involves, you know, a cast of 20 and a big orchestra, and that's your passion, then you should write that. I mean, I do think that one has to recognize the realities, but if we all recognize the realities, then all we would have is one person show, because that's, of course, the no-sell, because that's what producers want. So, uh, you know, yes, I suppose you want to do something that you can actually get produced, particularly when you begin, but, but I hate having to limit one's vision for, you know, just because producers are, are frightened and, and, and can't wait any longer. Good point. Many of the songs from Wicked have become, uh, to give the phrase, popular. Uh, songs like Defying Gravity, popular and for good. When you were working on the score, did you deliberately try and set out to write the kind of songs that would be liftable from the show? Or were you always intent on writing songs that just move the story forward? If they came out, fine. Well, <laughs> because clearly in the old days, writers were writing for radio and television airplay, which doesn't really exist anymore for theater. Well, yeah, but it helps if you have a, a song or a couple of songs that, that step out, so to speak, of the show, because it just helps, you know, the, the show get into the zeitgeist. Um, but the truth is, for me, <laughs> um, though I kind of always try to see if I can find that moment, actually... I, I, I always think that I'm doing this song that's going to do it, and it's that song over here. I mean, when, when we did Godspell, um, I thought that All Good Gifts was the hit song, and then Day by Day mm -hmm. became the hit song. And in, in Wicked, I thought that if there was any song that was really going to step out, it was the Love Do What As Long As You're Mine, which has a little bit stepped out. I mean, people do perform it a lot, but, but not any means, you know, like Defying mm -hmm. Gravity or Popular, which are so incredibly show-specific. So it really just shows you you should just tell your story and, you know, and if you have a moment that deserves to be musicalized and you, you musicalize it successfully so that, <clears throat> so that you really express what that moment is and what the character is doing at that moment, in, in some instances it, it can become universal or it speaks to a universal emotional truth for mm -hmm. people and then that song can, can can step out of the show itself. Do you use your book writer when indeed you are writing words and music to kind of edit you or kind of offer you feedback? Oh yeah, sure. I mean that's the great thing about having a collaborator, um, whether it's another songwriter like with Alan, you know, if I if I work with Alan Menken, we sort of help each other, even though he completely writes all the music and I completely write all the lyrics, but we do every now and then there's a suggestion or two. But basically, that's what's happening. But, I mean, I'll tell you a great story about Alan Menken. So the first song that we ever wrote together was Colors of the Wind. Pocahontas. For, for Pocahontas. And um, finished the song, sent it out to Disney. They just completely flipped out. Everybody loved the song. They were all very excited. Our collaboration was off to a great start. And we were ready to go into the studio with 90-piece orchestra and record this song. And, um, and the day before the recording session, Alan called me and he said, I just have to tell you something, and I feel a little embarrassed saying this, but I really don't like the lyric at the end of the song. I just don't, I, I just don't think it goes in the song. And, um, and the, the lyric was, um, through your life's an empty hull, till you get it through your skull, you can paint with all the colors <laughs> of the wind. Triple line. Um, but yeah, because, you know, I like, actually, I use it to, to excess, and I have to stop doing that triple line thing because <laughs> it's starting to be a cliche for me. But anyway, I had done that, and <clears throat> Alan said, I just, I don't like those, I don't like the words in that song. I don't like the word skull. I don't think it belongs in the song. I don't like hull. It feels forced. And, you know, and I give an elaborate explanation about how difficult it was to rhyme colors and nothing rhymes with colors and la, la, la. And I whined for a little while. But then, you know, I always feel like in, that collaborations are a marriage. And if your collaborator really doesn't like something, there's always another solution. So, <clears throat> you know, I struggled with this for, you know, a few <coughs> some hours trying to work out the triple rhyme, and I couldn't do it. And finally, I just thought, well, I just, the hell with it. I'll abandon the triple rhyme, and I'll do something else. And I came up with, with what is now the end of the song, which is, you can own the earth and still, or you'll own as earth until you can paint with all the colors of the wind. So much better. <laughs> 
thank you. I have an Academy Award because Alan made me change that. 